Hello and a very warm welcome. We are continuing our travels through the length and breadth of India, a journey that began in Kanyakumari, made its way to Trivandrum, Tiruvananthapuram rather, then to Coimbatore, then to Wayanad, and we have finally reached Mysore here in Karnataka. These parts of Karnataka will be voting in the second phase. I'm Barkha Dutt, you're with the Mojo Story. In a few moments from now, we'll be talking to Yogendra Yadav on how he assesses how the elections are going so far for both the BJP and the opposition. According to him, in columns he's written for the print, the Modi charisma is waning. I'm quoting him. But how is the opposition doing? There are challenges for the opposition as well. Around Rahul Gandhi, speculation continues as to where he might finally contest from after the Vayanad polls are over, will he possibly move to Uttar Pradesh? In Tiruvananthapuram, a triangular contest is exposing the fault lines between the left and the Congress, both members of the India bloc, on the ground. Rajiv Chandrasekhar is going up against Shashi Tharoor, but you also have the left, similarly in Vayanad, where Annie Raja, in an interview to me, wanted to know why why Rahul Gandhi was contesting from Wayanad at all. So there's a lot to talk about. There's been the Anna Malai phenomena. There's been the BJP's mission south. Can all of this really make a difference on the ground where the DMK actually has a wager that they're going to sweep Tamil Nadu again? And if they do, what does it mean for the opposition? Here in Karnataka, I met with Chief Minister Siddharamaya. Mr. Siddharamaya is arguing that the Modi factor has diminished. He described Devi Gowda, who is in partnership with the BJP, to be now what he called a communal leader. So there's a lot to talk about. And our newsmaker on the program today is Yugendra Yadav, who argued in the print its advantage for the India bloc. Why does he make that argument? How does he make a case for that? Let's introduce him on the program today as we look both back at phase one and ahead at the other phrases. Namaskar uh, and greetings, Yogendraji. Always a pleasure to talk to you. This time after too long a gap, uh, I hope the, the gaps won't remain as long going ahead. Let me uh, let me start uh, by asking you, you know, the, I'm in Mysore and I met with Chief Minister Siddharamaya. Mysore is his hometown. He was very confident that the opposition has an opening. Uh, he felt that there was an undercurrent. He felt that the undercurrent is not very visible. But this is his estimation. Now, cynical people will say every side argues for its own. You talk to the opposition, they'll say, Hamara chance hai. You talk to the BJP, they'll say it's the Modi wave. But before you were a politician, you've been a cephologist. There's a certain science in this. Why did you write in the print that this could be headwinds or a head start uh, for the India bloc after phase one? Uh, thank you, Barkha. And you are absolutely right. Uh... It is normal, and in a sense, it's only appropriate for any politician, uh, political leader, to say that when they are in the contest, it is for them to argue that they are doing very well. That's normal. So I wouldn't blame anyone, and I would not take away any credit from anyone for that. Uh, but on this show, let's talk facts. And please check and counter me on any fact that we talk about. I'm a political activist. I'm no longer a psychologist. Uh, and yes, I'm definitely for India coalition, but on this show, I can only present facts to you. Uh, I have written that in phase one, the opposition India coalition has a head start. There are three reasons for that. One is pure electoral coincidence of the past. Second is political trend of the last four or five years. Third is hardcore data that came yesterday from the turnout, which is not part of my article. That's something that I have looked at. Let me put the first thing first, which is a purely a coincidence. Mind you, there's nothing very special about it. It so happens that the first phase has parity of India and NDA. Among the 102 seats that we are looking at, 49 seats were won by today's India coalition and 49 were won by today's NDA coalition. It is unusual because actually, as you know, NDA's strength in the parliament is much bigger than that of India coalition. And because of Tamil Nadu going in the first phase, we have this artificial kind of parity. But let's look at the second thing, which is the trend in the last four, year, four or five years. After 2019, 
we have had many uh, assembly elections. If you take those assembly elections into account, that would mean that uh, India's number of seats would slightly go down in Tamil Nadu. It will slightly go up in, uh, actually it will go down in Uttar Pradesh as well, but it will go up in Rajasthan and so on and so forth. And the net result is that India coalition starts with an edge in 55 seats and NDA in 42. That's the result of this thing. And it so happens that some of the regions that went to polls are regions where opposition tends to do well. It's again a coincidence, Eastern Rajasthan belt, which is a Kisan Andolan belt, Western Uttar Pradesh, especially the Muslim dominated areas, and Mahakaushal of Madhya Pradesh and Vidarbha of uh, Maharashtra. And as you know, these are areas which Congress has kind of somewhat retained even after its electoral setbacks. The third factor is very important, and that's fresh, that's the development of the last 24 hours, which is turnout figures. Now, there's been enormous confusion, needless confusion about how much the turnout has been. And I sometimes suspect that there is a reluctance on the part of some people to release the exact figures. The figures, as we have gathered from Election Commission's website, are as follows. Last time, in these very 102 constituencies, the turnout was 69.9, let us say 70%. In these exactly 102 constituencies yesterday, the, the almost final figure, which has been released by Election Commission till midday today, is 65.3%, which means there has been a drop of 4.6% percentage points. Barkha, that's huge. If Sensex were to fall by 4.6% one day, God you know, I, I don't wish it to, to the census. It will be huge international news all over the world because 4.6% is huge drop. The question is, who has dropped? And I have a hypothesis. My hypothesis is, and I, I checked for that because, you know, this could happen all over. This could be because of just Garmi's, you know, summer and so on. I analyzed it with my colleagues. And we found that in the seats that were held by NDA, the drop is 5.9%. And in the seats that were held by India or anyone else, other than BJP or BJP's allies, the drop is only 3.2%. So it's 3% versus can, can, 6%. Can, can I hold you there? Because that's a critical point. Because it's one thing to say that there's a drop over 4% in voter turnout. You are making the argument, and I want you to just repeat the figures so we can have them on our screen. You are making the argument essentially that there is a greater greater drop in voter turnout in seats held by the NDA compared to the seats held by the India bloc. Now, can you Absolutely. share the numbers again? Again, I'll tell you. The overall average drop is 4.6%. But it is not even. If you look at the seats that were held by NDA, and there were 49, almost half the seats were held by NDA last time. They are across the country because it's spread across the country. The drop is 5.9%, 5.9. And in the non-NDA seats, in the remaining you know, uh, 53 seats, the drop is only 3.2. Now, that's a very significant difference. It's not a minor difference here, which leads me to my hypothesis. And my hypothesis is that the enthusiastic BJP voters did not come up to vote. Many of them would be, among those who voted for Mr. Modi, there would be three categories. Those who again came back and voted for him, for BJP. Some of those who may have shifted to the opposition. We don't know how much because we have no evidence. But there would be a third category. Those who didn't feel enthused enough this time, but can't possibly go and vote for opponent to Mr. Modi. These are the ones who just stayed back home. And that is why we see much higher drop in BJP areas than in non-BJP areas. And that's bad news, Barkha. And that's why uh, there is a lot of anxiety, should I say, in the BJP circle, something you must have witnessed in the last 24 hours. Many of BJP's uh, uh, mouthpieces in the media are coming out with strange kinds of statements. Prime Minister himself tweets to you know, assure, in a sense, his supporters. Something big is happening here. 
let's explore this a little bit more uh, because obviously you have a political hat but you're saying i'm talking only numbers you say there's been an absence of enthusiasm in some bjp voters which is reflected in a 5.9% drop in voter turnout for nda seats among the seats among the overall or out of the 4.6% overall drop yeah. why do you think this might be why do you think this might be and uh, can i can i can i ask you to clarify before that just so that we are absolutely accurate the overall drop is 4.6% and within this within this it's a 5.9% of seats right it's within this it's not an overall let, drop no 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 let let me again clarify the 102 yeah. seats where the average drop is 4.6 now you split these 102 seats into two parts those 49 seats where the uh, nda won last time and the remaining 53 seats you just compartmentalize it into two in the first segment the drop is 5.9% and in the second segment the drop is only 3.2% so we are looking at something serious and substantial there is a much higher drop much higher drop in turn uh, in the bjp areas compared to non bjp now, there can be two or three explanations for that. I'm sure people will come up with all kinds. I mean, this is a fact. This fact cannot be challenged. And if I'm wrong, please hold me to that. Now, there are two interpretations. Someone would say, and BJP is not short of uh, uh, spin doctors. So the spin could be, well, our voters were so confident of our victory that they thought, what's the point in going? That could well be the case. And I have no way of disproving it at this stage. Uh, but remember, because this is already an explanation being put forward by BJP supporters. Uh, I would say, all right, but in, even in that case, you are conceding that the overwhelming proportion of those who did not turn up to vote were potential BJP voters. Even they are conceding. That's the point I'm making. My interpretation is different. And I'm saying they did not come up to vote because they felt less enthused. At the same time, they were not so angry as to come and vote against the BJP. I heard so many people say that. You must have come across people of that kind, but possibly not in Kerala or Tamil Nadu. Yeah. But as you go further, you will find I mean, so many people say, opposition You know, so what would that person do? He would just stay back home. That's what's happening. So would, That's you, my so would you would you would you define that as an absence of anti-incumbency, but also an absence of enthusiasm? Well, it is it is a mild anti-incumbency. It is not the kind of anti-incumbency that you witnessed in uh, 1977, for example. So it's clearly not a wave of that kind, in which case people would have come in much higher numbers. And, you know, the standard thing, as they say in American political science, throw the rascals out in that kind of an election the turnout goes up uh, massively and everyone comes out etc we are not looking at something of that kind but remember this election has been preceded by two wave elections in both wave elections the turnout was higher and higher and suddenly there is a sharp drop what accounts for this sharp drop let me take one case in point uh, rajasthan Rajasthan has had an election just three months ago, four months ago. In that election, the turnout in Rajasthan, in the assembly election held in December 2023, the turnout was 75%. And in the same Rajasthan, turnout drops to 57% within four months. What's happening? You know, now clearly it, that. I'm sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Clearly, go ahead. Uh, clearly, the voters, you know, uh, because earlier, the, the, now, mind you, this has always been the case between the parliamentary and the uh, between assembly and parliament. Vote turnout drops slightly in Rajasthan. The drop used to be five to seven percent earlier, but now it's a drop of eighteen percentage points. Clearly, uh, there is an absence of a, if 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 it was a Modi wave, if it was a continuation of Modi wave, the third Modi wave then there is no reason to believe why the turnout would have dropped so much. That's so all that I'm saying. So it's not a wave election thus far, neither in favor 
of the prime minister nor visibly against him like a wave is it's not a wave election that would be the way to i would maybe focus. so now i would mix my data with my own personal observations i mean so far what i have spoken is strictly data and i'm open to questioning by anyone on that now my interpretation when i traveled in on ground which i did in rajasthan in western uttar pradesh in haryana and punjab recently uh i find that in terms of issues in terms of disquiet there is enormous disquiet on issues of employment on price rise on agni veer on the state of farmers there is enormous disquiet and people on their own do not mention ayodhya if you probe them they mention ayodhya most of them are happy with the bjp for having done it but uh, on their own they don't mention it now there is so there is enormous disquiet as far as livelihood and uh, uh, economic issues are concerned however that disquiet does not get consolidated largely because of the media and even when it, it is formed as an election issue it all of it does not translate into voting because the opposition leaves something to be desired opposition doesn't provide them with as strong a, an alternative as they might may have wanted to see so here you have massive disquiet translating them itself into weak issues translating itself into weaker voting if the disquiet were to be expressed 100% into voting bjp could have been wiped out we would have seen a wave against the bjp and one more thing i can tell you about kha just just imagine something because uh, as uh, you know all of us have seen history just imagine if it was a congress government and if the bjp was in opposition and if there was so much disquiet on the issue of employment on the issue of uh, price rise on recruitment in the army on uh, the state of farmers bjp would have made this into the biggest issue on earth and, and of course on boot if there was some scandal like the electoral bonds bjp would have taken it to everyone in the country but so yes you, the but you know has, yeah. yeah no i was just going to respond to that by saying one of the things we observed is that the prime minister has managed to and the bjp has managed to politically uh, outlast this quiet demonetization covid uh, and not be politically penalized for it and at the moment what we are seeing is that the lower voter voting numbers are in your argument an expression of this disquiet there's a question related to this from our uh, audience uh, uh, prasad duguri says is the drop in nda seats enough to shrink the margins against nd uh, it's a very good question uh, let me uh, first begin by saying uh, what this drop amounts to what does 4.6% mean there were about 16 crore people who were entitled to voting yesterday so 4.6% of 16 crore is 76 lakh people there is a debt you know there is also in that sense hypo, sort of in that sense as a manner of speaking 76 lakh people who should have voted didn't decided to stay back home it's that big a number that we are talking about uh, would that by itself turn every seat no it won't Uh, but remember in terms of uh, in terms of percent of votes cast we are already speaking now 4.6% of the electorate would mean something like 7 to 8% of the votes cast 7 to 8% of the vote cast and assuming that 5% of them were bjp 2% of them were obviously other parties as well we cannot assume that all those who stayed back were only bjp voters so if we are looking at a 2 to 3% differential then i would wish to tell you that at least 1/10 of the seats are decided by a margin which is within 3 to 5% so yes it would make a difference to some seats not all okay let me ask you this as you yourself said the parliamentary seats in the first phase included tamil nadu those 39 seats it's been despite uh, despite a very high voltage campaign run by mr k anamalai that's a jisko kehte hain hindi mein wo gadh hai gadh hai opposition ka and and it's expected going by polls to remain mostly that way we'll see when the results come in. could it be that phase 1 also has the seats that are stronger for the opposition 
and in other geographies, other parliamentary constituencies, the disquiet that you speak about may not be as manifest, uh, you know, because it also matters where you are, where you are, what the organization is in that place, what the issues are, you know, in, in, in for example, in, in the southern states, uh, Hindutva is not an issue, but in, in, in other pockets of the country, it might well be. I'm just giving an example, not that, the, you know, not that there's a single issue election. Yeah. Uh, so, Barka, I gave three reasons for the opposition having an advantage. The first I said was purely coincidental. That would disappear in the second and third phase and so on and so forth. Because obviously, if you have first phase, which is lopsided in favor of uh, uh, India coalition, you would have other phases which would be lopsided in favor of NDA. Obviously, that's a, it's a logic of averages. Uh, so that would disappear. But the second and the third reasoning may stay, which is to say, development since 2019 that may have worked to the advantage of opposition and secondly the and finally the logic of turnout which we have to see we have to keep monitoring it uh, but the important thing to uh, notice here uh, barkha is that this while the existence of tamil nadu no doubt loads the whole thing but for the for a moment now let's forget tamil nadu let's simply look at the fact that uh, this phase included a tiny pocket of Maharashtra, Vidarbha, a pocket of Madhya Pradesh, Mahakaushal, a pocket of Bihar, uh, central, uh, you know, southern Bihar now, a pocket of Uttar Pradesh, which is close to uh, Uttarakhand, uh, a pocket of Rajasthan. So we are getting a sample of almost the entire India, except states like Gujarat, the western coast and, and Karnataka. So we are getting a sample of it. And if there is it, and mind you, turnout drop is sharper in all these places. So if this trend holds, it's a, it's a limited statement. It's a conditional statement. If this trend holds, then we are looking at the entire geography of BJP dominance. Uh, that does not change with the, uh, with the non-existence of Tamil Nadu in the next phases. Uh, and about... Uh, uh, about disquiet, I would just underline, uh, I would remind you of the CSDS support, which has been taken by Hindu a few uh, a week ago, uh, yes, yes. which confirms what all of us have seen on the ground, that unemployment and uh, price rise were the top to two be issues. the biggest were the top, top political were the top issues. Two issues that farmers are dissatisfied and people feel farmers need a better deal, uh, that livelihood concerns are deep across the country. This is not just first phase. Across the country, we have these things. So to my mind, what the question we are asking is not so much whether there is disquiet or not, and whether it's only in first phase or would continue. To my mind, it continues everywhere. The real question is the ability, the, 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 potential of the media in picking this disquiet and turning it into an issue and the capacity of the opposition parties to turn the issues into votes. These are the two questions which remain open and for which I don't have a good answer right now. But I, I just had a question on the CSDS services you quoted from it. I did interview Professor Sanjay Kumar on that survey and that same survey still did give the, the, the vote share advantage to the BJP nationally despite the fact that unemployment and price rise are, are the biggest issues for people, which takes us back to why the opposition is not able to channel these issues into seemingly greater electoral success for itself. Uh, that's a good question, and it's a very fair question to be posed to opposition. As I said, honestly, if the opposition had uh, half the capacity uh, and if the media had half the honesty that it did in 2004, uh, we are honestly, Barkha, on the ground, we are looking at 2004 replay uh, in terms of sentiments. Both of us are old enough to remember 2004. Both of us remember what the scene looked like on the ground in 2004, how India Shining was being played out in the media, how the picture was different on the ground. And finally, all of us remember that till the last day, almost no one had predicted the BJP's uh, loss and that finally they lost. But two things were different. One, the media, while they were reporting, while they were uh, amplifying the India shining uh, rhetoric, but they were also reporting everything else, which is not happening today. 
And secondly, the opposition for all its weaknesses, even then, even then opposition was fragmented, was not so coherent, but it had, to my mind, slightly greater capacity to consolidate these issues into a political alternative. So in, the sen in that sense, in the coming five weeks or so, the two things that we need, once again, I would underline, is issues are there. Just like someone said that there are issues in election, they are not made, they are made. So there are issues on the ground, now there is a time to make it, there is a time to reach the people, and there is a time to vote for it. For this to be done, that is still the deficit, and I agree, the opposition uh, has to work harder than it has done so far. In a previous column that you wrote for the print, uh, you said I you were traveling across India and you wrote about your encounters with voters, some who vote for BJP, some who vote for your side. And bahut se logo ne aap se kaha, aayega to Modi hi, some with, as you said, a drumbeat, some in despair. That speaks to what we are just talking about. This feeling that, yes, there is disquiet, there are things that make people unhappy, but aur kaun hai? You know, it, it, I, I, sometimes we've seen or con hai elections in India. Is this an or con hai election? Is there a danger of that? Well, uh, Barkha, if there was a clear answer to or con hai, if there was a leader who could compete Mr. Modi in terms of popularity ratings, uh, then BJP wouldn't get even three-figure mark in this election. You know, honestly, I can tell you, uh, they, could, they would have been just drubbed. This would have been drubbing for the BJP. The reason why BJP is in election and seemed like a front runner is because that question, has, you know, in terms of individual, in terms of party, in terms of coalition, uh, if they, if India coalition was uh, presented to people in terms of a very solid coalition with a clear agenda, with a clear leadership, which can almost match Mr. Modi, uh, that would have been a different story. But we are not in that universe. We are in this universe where we live in. When you say, Sorry, you that say they, yeah. yeah, I was saying when you say that there isn't a leader in the opposition to directly take on the prime minister in terms of personal popularity ratings, isn't that one of the key problems? I'm not saying it undermines the problems of unemployment or price rise. I'm saying when you go to the voter and the voter says, my prices, you know, I, my, it takes much more to run my kitchen. And then they turn around and say, or con, hey, what is the opposition's answer to that? And are you conceding that that is a problem, that there isn't one singular person with the charisma of the prime minister? That's what you seem to be saying, unless I've got you wrong. Uh, but I'm not passing my own judgment on any of the opposition leaders. I have my own okay. assessment of them. Uh, and I have my own assessment of Mr. Modi. As you know, I mean, that's a, right. it's a fairly harsh judgment. I don't need to get into why I think Mr. Modi is a curse on Indian democracy. Uh, but that's a different story. Uh, I, we are simply talking popularity levels, which are mm -hmm. ranked by opinion polls, uh, right. which are seen on the ground. Uh, there is the reality of leaders and there is the image of leaders. And image is what finally counts in elections. So in terms of the image as is received on the ground, uh, there is no doubt. I mean, if you look at the CSDS poll, Mr. Modi is still way ahead of anyone else. Uh, so clearly that is an advantage. And that is precisely what has allowed BJP to cover up its massive governance failures. Uh, so that is indeed the case. So there's no, uh, you know, uh, there's no point denying that. That's why BJP is in the battle today. Uh, and of course, I should always underline the fact that mainstream media being so shockingly and so brazenly pro-Modi in a way that's a shame for democracy. That's the other reason why Mr. Modi is in the, in the race today. So these things keep him in the race. Right now, we are taking all this for granted. We, we are saying, all right, these are structural features. These things exist. Media is unlikely to become fair tomorrow morning. And Mr. Modi's ratings are unlikely to drop tomorrow morning even after a, a, a scandal like uh, election bonds. Given all that, I'm saying that uh, the, the situation, and I've said in that article, which you've read, and thank you for reading. Sometimes I feel no one reads what you write. <laughs> so in that article, I, 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 about... I read everything that you write. <laughs> thank you. Uh, so it's, I, I talk about return of normal politics in abnormal times. 
and what it creates is dissonance and the dissonance is this you ask someone aapka kya hal hai kharab hai saab dhanda kaisa hai manda hai saab gaon mein kya hai naukri nahi hai saab kheti ka kya hai nuksan ho gaya saab acha desh ka kya hal hai desh ka hal acha hai you know that's one dissonance second dissonance is this uh, who are you going to vote no this time i don't think i'll vote mr modi what about your family well one person might vote but others are not what about your friend and family in your village in my village bjp vote will go down so what's going to happen aayega to modi you know that is what this dissonance does that you think that you are an exception and everything else is a norm uh this is precisely what the media has created in this country and yes it works to bjp's advantage yes that's precisely why dictators control the media because finally it but helps I, them but I, but as you have yourself written in your own column uh we, that the opposition needs a new political language the media explains one part of the story the mainstream media and the mainstream media i would say is not pro modi it's pro power kal sarkar badlegi the same media will probably be pro jo jo aaj supplicant hai wo kal bhi supplicant honge i think i don't know the question is aapne likha tha ki baki sab chhodo hame ek new political bhasha dhoondni padegi and i think that's very important because people genuinely believe either people are very subdued and they don't want to tell you who they are voting for or they genuinely believe that the place of india has improved in the world the standing of india the stature of india the self image of themselves as indians and that has been one of the most successful political communication messaging of this government so i take your point about mainstream media but i take you back to your own columns which as you can now see i read very carefully because i'm quoting for an earlier from an earlier one that the opposition needs a new political language what is that language yeah you absolutely right if you ask any modi supporter bhai right? so why do you like him uh, they usually mention two or three things beginning with desh ka maan bada hai now you can keep arguing ke bhaiya kahan bada hai ye jab jaate hain new york mein to indians hi khade hote hain sadak pe aur koi to aata nahi hai etc but it doesn't matter you know to be ordinary people uh, as you say smart political communication you could use the word propaganda but that has succeeded there is no doubt about it number 2 uh, 370 modi ne 370 kar diya you can keep arguing whether it's a good thing or a bad thing you can say ask jammu hindus about what has happened to three, uh, by 370 but it doesn't matter this this bit of propaganda has stuck and has helped the bjp and third is if you press them they also talk of ram mandir dekhi ram mandir ban so everything other than to uh, other than those things which actually affect their livelihood for half an hour they'll speak to you about their livelihood and in the next 3 minutes they will mention these three items so and you are absolutely right that the opposition needs a new language a language uh, of culture a language of emotions a language of uh, a uh, genuine pride in one's culture and civilization which is one of the most normal things anywhere in the world for everyone to have a uh, language of recovery of uh, tradition recovery of nationalism recovery of religion but barkha all these are long term things uh in the remaining 5 weeks i do not expect the opposition to work out these things these are long term things in the remaining 5 weeks i want the opposition to do only two things which can still change this election one is electoral bonds if the truth of electoral bond reaches the villages of this country i things will change i've tested it in my you, travel you, you think, i you said think with, it's a mass issue you think it's a mass issue because it's a very technical issue to explain because no, 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 people are not so cynical about ek minute ek just a small question people are also cynical about the nexus between business and politics generally the average person who's not part of that rarefied world feels ki ha ye log to aisa hi hai aisa hi chalta hai that's why i'm asking you why you think it can be a mass issue uh it is because uh, number one i don't think it's as complicated as rafael was or as other things were number two this is an issue where evidence is not in doubt on uh, both fours the government always kept saying there is no evidence on uh, 2g they always said it is speculation sure the money trail is established and why people find electoral bonds too complicated to understand but it is very simple thing to explain and for a change congress has a language which is actually very simple language prepaid postpaid 
forced rate. That quid pro quo is what needs to be explained. Uh, will it make a difference? Yes. While everyone would say, "Dekhi, sab chanda lete hain, sab aisa karte hain," but you see, the 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 USP of Mr. Modi has been an impression, cultivated artificial impression, that he is away from all these things. Modi ye nahi karta. Sirf desh ki baat sochta hai. If an ordinary person knows that pharma companies had paid BJP elect, you know, money. after which changes were made which have led to the rise in the cost of medicines and certain dubious practices have been allowed this is bound to affect the bjp's things of course it will work it does work and i tried it barkha in some of the villages after the conversation i sat down with a couple of rss people and i said acha for 2 minutes just believe what i'm saying so i just explained the electoral bond story this is what happened they were scandalized they said na ye nahi ho sakta na 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 modi ji ye nahi kar sakte they were shaken the trouble is that this information has not reached people uh, <clears throat> the media will not take it and the opposition has somehow not met there are all kinds of obstacles you see it's easy to blame opposition but when they insert advertisements and the newspapers do not publish their paid advertisements you have to sympathize with them so it's it's hard they are doing it but it's hard uh number 2 uh that would actually make a difference is the five guarantees of the congress party you are in karnataka please check out uh, you are in mysuru ask people uh, of the guarantees that uh, were made by congress party in before assembly elections whether those things have worked or not and whether they are willing to believe the new guarantees that congress party is giving to my mind for once congress has got its electoral election manifesto right which is to say it touches on the real pain points of india and for every one of them the 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 congress party has made one promise which seems to which can touch the people the trouble is most people most congress workers most congress leaders do not know about their own promises so that's the second thing i would want the opposition to do if they do this election even now can turn okay it's very interesting because mr siddaramaiya actually uh, spoke a lot about these election guarantees and he said that modi ki guarantee was a borrowed idea of, uh, and he said that in the political imagination there was now going to be a competition for these guarantees so it is going to be a big talking point let me end uh, with uh, with a question about data uh, pradeep gupta of access my india uh, in a podcast i should say recorded well before i set out on my travel so that's about maybe over 10 days ago uh he's he said that he said there were 257 seats in which the bjp had a strike rate of 95% last time so he said that isme to grow karna mumkin nahi hai ya same rahega ya kam aayega 257 seats so according to him the real battle is the remaining seats seats where the bjp had a 60% strike rate for example states like uttar pradesh also states like west bengal assam odisha where the bjp still has space to improve conversely for the opposition it has to hold on to 105 seats where the bjp got only 5 seats last time so the opposition doesn't have to just take from the bjp it also has to defend what it already had now how do you where do you see the fault lines where the challenges in terms of communication you have stressed electoral bonds guarantees isko mudda banaiye isko amplify kariye mushkil kahan hai where are the challenges the personal rankings of 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 the prime minister some of their successful communication messaging but what else what about let's say the india block and the cohesion i met ani raja in bayna she was very upset about rahul gandhi contesting from her. shashi tharoor is very upset about the left contesting against him in tiruvananthapuram so these fault lines are there uh, look barkha uh, it is impossible for the left not to contest tiruvananthapuram and it is uh, impractical for congress not to put their leader in a constituency which is a safe constituency so of course if you ask them they will talk about these things uh, but i'm uh, glad at least rahul gandhi is not complaining about uh, 
uh, her contesting the election. I mean, she's a very fine activist, and I'm very glad that uh, these contestations take place. To my mind, that's not the real big issue. In Kerala, there is, uh, you know, uh, no way UDF and LDF will not contest against each other. If they do, they would only be opening floodgates for the BJ. Uh, the issue is Bengal, where they could have avoided uh, fighting against each other. The issue is Assam, where there is still some little overlap that could have been avoided. The issue is uh, Bihar, where one or two seats still are being done in a way that could be avoided. But you no, know, uh, Barkha, the way I look at it is this. If opposition had 100% cohesion, sense of purpose, then Mr. Modi wouldn't have been the prime minister in any case. I mean, we are where we are because of the various limitations the opposition has faced in this country. So I take it as given, just as I take Delhi's summer uh, heat as given. This is given for me. Uh, we start with this, we move forward. Uh, and okay. we try and uh, see our way forward. On Pradeep Gupta's analysis, I must say, actually, I agree with that structural analysis. I think that's a very fair analysis. And that's a point I keep making. My simple point is, all right, please tell me, in order to you know get this mythical figure of 400 which incidentally is going to uh, boomerang on the bjp finally but uh, you know to in order to increase substantially from 2019 where would the bjp possibly gain gujarat 26 out of 26 rajasthan 25 virtually out of 25 himachal uttarakhand delhi haryana <laughs> madhya pradesh chhattisgarh where would they gain so they can gain possibly in uttar pradesh Mind you, for that, they have to increase from 2019, a very steep task. Number two, possibly Bengal, where again, mind you, Mamta has already reduced them from 18 already. For them to climb up to 18 is still a, a sort of serious task. To go beyond 18 is a very, very uphill task. Uh, Odisha, Yes, they have a headroom to grow, but for that they need uh, Naveen Patnaik to be very, very friendly opponent. Uh, will Naveen Patnaik want to be so? That's a question. In Telangana, at the most, they can add a couple of seats, but will how many seats will the BJP add in Andhra Pradesh, Telangana, Tamil Nadu, and Kerala put together? Maybe two or three. But the opposition's so, challenges. But the opposition's challenges that. You need the BJP not just to keep status quo, you need the BJP to come down for you to have a chance in the game, right? Exactly. So as I wrote uh, earlier, opposition has to have a threefold strategy. One is to block the BJP in states like Tamil Nadu, Andhra Pradesh, Kerala, and so on, where BJP has virtually no presence. Just block them from gaining anything significant, which is not much of a task as of today. Uh, second is to snatch from BJP in states like Bihar, Maharashtra, Karnataka, uh, uh, these are places from where things can be snatched from the BJ. Uh, and third is nibble away, nibble away tiny little things from states like Gujarat, Madhya Pradesh, Rajasthan, and all other states. One or two, two seats from Gujarat, four seats from Madhya Pradesh, uh, seven or eight from Rajasthan, maybe one or two seats from uh, Delhi, three or four seats from uh, uh, Haryana, maybe one seat from Himachal, one seat from Uttarakhand. That's what these are. These are not impossibilities. I'm not giving you some fantastic political hyperbole figures. These are real doable things. And having tra traveled in Rajasthan, I can tell you what I said about Rajasthan, you know, this, this uh, the figures for Rajasthan is very much real figures. This is very much approachable. Anything like eight to 10 seats for, uh, for the opposition is not a fantastic figure as of today. So that's possible. Uh, it's possible for opposition to bring the BJP below 272. I'm not again giving you some hyperbole figure of reducing BJP to 100. That would have been possible. That was the mood of the country. But for that, we need better issue formulation and better opposition preparation. But even today, BJP can be brought below 272. In that sense, this election is still open even today. Well, I think that's the note to end this uh, this the, this conversation on Yogendra Yadav's uh, wager or estimation uh, that the BJP can be brought uh, below the magic mark of 272. Yogendra Ji, thank you. It's been a fascinating conversation. We'll talk after a couple more phases are over and compare notes then. Thank you very much.
Take care. Thank you. Dhaniwad. And please enjoy Mysore. Mysore is one of my favorite cities. It's a it is lovely truly city. the cultural and intellectual capital of uh, Karnataka. Uh, has some of the finest writers, activists, thinkers. Enjoy Mysore. Thank you, Yogendra. Namaskar. Thank, Thank you. you. And that's it on this edition of Dhaba of Democracy. We are indeed enjoying Mysore. It is a beautiful, beautiful city, uh, home to R.K. Narayan. Parts of the city actually look like the Malgudi days uh, that the famous author uh, created and that so many of us, our childhood was shaped by, by Malgudi days. If not Malgudi days, remember Guide. Uh, of Devanand and Vahita Rehman fame, all created by R.K. Narayan. So yes, Mysore is truly lovely. And by the way, we're sitting in front of an auto dhaba. Uh, if you see behind me, uh, it's an auto rickshaw with a kind of collapsible kitchen at the back. And food is cooked at the back. He parks here every day. And I had lunch here, paratha and a piece of dry chicken. And it was absolutely fabulous. So we continue to bring you the flavors of uh, democracy from our travels, from our team, our cameraman, Anup Kumar, our driver, Vinod Verma, and myself, Barkhadat, uh, we will travel from Kanyakumari to Kashmir in a different constituency, a different part of India every day. If you are not a Mojo member, please do sign up. Please do uh, click the link that you should find below and do become a member of our community. It will give you an opportunity to participate in our shows, to meet us, to get published on our platforms and to get first access to many of our reports and interviews. Thank you for watching. Namaskar and hello everyone. Welcome to a ride through the heart and the soul of India. Because when the election season comes, who wins, 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 who tells a story where every conversation will spice up your day. Experience the masala, the flavor, the swad of this election with us as we take a lovely, a unique road trip from the south to the north of India, traveling thousands of kilometers to bring you the flavor of this election. इलेक्शन सर पर है वोटर अपना मन बना रहे हैं ऐसे में आपको चाहिए सही फैक्ट सही ज्ञान सही नॉलेज इसी कड़ी में मोजो स्टोरी लेकर आ रहा है एक खास कार्यक्रम बैलेट की बात मैं हूं पॉलिटिकल रिसर्चर कार्तिक बत्रा और मैं चाहता हूं आपके दिन के केवल दो मिनट कैंडिडेट्स पार्टीज अलायसेस इशू इन सब पर होगी बात और होगा रोज आपका एक छोटा सा पोलिटिकल टेस्ट स्पेशल प्राइजेस फॉर दो आर द बेस्ट तो बैलेट की बात कट द नॉइस सिर्फ सच और फैक्ट्री वॉइस